Well, my family came um, from Poland. They must have come over before the um, First World War, or, or very much in the early part of it, when uh, things weren't very good in Poland and uh, Jewish people uh, were quite pleased to get out of it. And they came over, uh, my mother was uh, Polish, and I think she, she must have met my father over here, but he was Polish. I'm not so, actually, I'm not so sure whether he wasn't Russian. Uh, so that was in the early part of the First World War. Um, and they came and they lived in um, West Hampstead in London, Greencroft Gardens. I remember Greencroft Gardens very well, actually, although we must have left Greencroft Gardens in about, oh, well, I was born in 1923, in 1930 maybe, I don't know, around about that time, for Aberdare Gardens, which was just round the corner. In Greencroft Gardens, uh, there was my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, that's her mother and father, and I remember them uh, vaguely, although they died at, uh, at Greencroft Garden. My father was a musician. He was um, a violinist. And he, he ran a sort of gypsy orchestra. And that, that's how he made his living. But he um, left us. He left my mother and decided to go over to um, South America, went to Buenos Aires. Now, he went when I was eight. So he left in 1931. Um, I remember him going. I remember him quite well, because he tried to teach me the violin. I didn't get very far with that. Got as far as I had a little violin, and you know, got <clears throat> got as far as G major scale, not much further than that. Uh, anyway, he left to make his fortune. <laughs> Whether he did or not, I don't know, because we never saw or heard of him uh, after he left. And uh, my sister, particularly, who was older than me, I was the youngest. Her sister was six years older than me, and she made uh, tremendous efforts to find out about him, get in touch with him. But I don't know, she never seemed to succeed, and I, I don't know what happened to him at all. And we have never been able to get any idea of that, which is rather strange, really. We moved to Aberdare Gardens. Uh, which was, I'd say, around the corner. And three of my um, cousins came, because it's sort of a mix-up with, with their families, came to live with us. So there were six of us. Uh, Paul, Teddy, June, they were. And we were, th so there were six of us, and we were Aubrey, my brother. Aubrey was four years older than me. And uh, we all, we all lived together, looked after by, or, well, my, the role was rather strange. My uncle, who was a civil engineer and very well qualified, and he was, um, he was naturalized over here. My uncle and aunt had an income, of course. My mother didn't. She was a pensioner. She didn't have a job. But my mother did the, uh, they paid for everything, the aunt and, and uncle. And my mother did the uh, 
housekeeping, looked after shopping and one, one thing and another. That was her main role before educating me, because I didn't go to school till the, uh, fairly late. But she uh, educated me uh, at home. I remember going to school for, for the first time. How old was I? About six, I suppose. Prep school. And um, stayed there till 1937, life was so extraordinary, really, that we were really very, very fortunate. And I don't think I was particularly bothered when he lay, he never uh, showed any particular interest in, in, in us. I don't know how the other two f um, felt about him. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing that being the sole survivor, as it were, that there's no one that I can sort of compare um, memories, all that sort of thing, with very few. I've got a cousin still. She's two years older than me, and. Um, she really uh, has quite an extraordinary memory, and uh, she wrote a book, which is there, on uh, her memories and experiences of, of the family. Well, in fact, I used to have music lessons with her, together with her. We played duets together. Well, I can't be more than uh, a year old there, can I? So that would be about 1924. That would be on holiday in Westgate or somewhere like that where we used to go. Of course, I don't remember that. Well, the people are um, my mother with the white hat at the back, and my grandmother with the black hat with the other hat on the right is my aunt, Anna. Who, who was never married, but she was instrumental in bringing us up and um, with her brother, Alfred, he's not in the photograph, my sister and brother and me and uh, a nanny. So you ask me for the earliest recollection, it's very difficult to say that because uh, you you know you heard one hears stories and you see photographs and you wonder whether it is because of that, those things, that uh, do you remember. So, but I certainly do remember to go, go and going with my father to the cinema and, and to see his shows. I remember him going off. Um, I don't, I'm not so sure we didn't go and see him off. I didn't know what was going on at that age. You don't, do you? You don't know what's going on. I do. I think that I, I was so, uh, we were so comfortable, if that's the right word, at, at the way things were being done and being done for us didn't really appreciate all what was being done for us um, and then um, wasn't particularly bothered. I think we did uh, think of him coming back. We certainly thought of him um, corresponding with us or being in touch some way or another. But he didn't and um, I think he must have come to a sticky end somewhere. I elected to go to boarding school, wanted to go to boarding school, and they said to me, well, we really can't afford to send you to boarding school. And uh, in those days, I don't know whether they do now, I don't think they do, but uh, they sit uh, what 
what was called the common entrance examination to public schools, if you wanted to go to a public school. And I sat the examination for the University College School in Hampstead and uh, passed that. Oh, and they said, if you, if you want to go to boarding school, you'll have to get a scholarship. <laughs> well, I don't know how I did, but I did. I, this Ellesmere, my, the headmaster of my prep school, he, uh, I don't know, he knew about Ellesmere. It was, um, um, well, it was a public school, but not a very well-known one. And he knew about it, and he thought that would be a good idea, and it would be quite a good idea if I tried to get a scholarship, which I happened to get. I don't quite know how, so that's how I got to the Ellesmere College in 1937, and stayed there for three years until I went to university. I did enjoy it, but I did all sorts of things. I, mean, I was quite good at, at cricket, and uh, squash and tennis, and we played rugger and we played hockey. So I, I enjoyed them all. I didn't enjoy rugger very much, but what I didn't enjoy was uh, running. I, and we had to, <laughs> we had to do a steeplechase every year. Everybody had to do it, and I always used to come last. And uh, by the time. I got in all the spectators and got away. <laughs> None of us were ever brought up to um, follow one religion rather than another, although we were educated at school in religion, semi-educated, as, as uh, I think people are, uh, semi-educated. And if, they have, if they're allowed to think for themselves, well, they get into trouble very often. I got into trouble at school. I was in a Church of England school where we went to um, chapel twice a day. The Padre really uh, ru ruled on fear. People were afraid of him. Hellfire and damnation, that sort of thing. Uh, and we were taught that, or tried to be taught, that uh, every, everything said in the Bible was, uh, was gospel, as you might say, gospel truth. Uh, and when you tried to think of uh, explain things yourself, you got into trouble. I got into trouble. We were talking about the feeding of the the, the fish with the fish. Well, all the stories. I mean, this is a good story. There's no question about that. And uh, I said, yes, I think that's a, that's a pretty good story, but you can't possibly believe it. And I got into trouble for <laughs> for that. No, the padre didn't wield a cane, but uh, but um, the masters wielded canes, and so did the prefects, and there was no question about that. But that, that was the situation I used to quite enjoy uh, the lessons and um, think, try not, not accept them as being, uh, because it seemed so stupid, the stories that, um, that were told. And how could you possibly, possibly believe them, really? And the other thing was, if if you weren't if you were caught not singing in chapel, then you got into trouble from the uh, the padre. <laughs> there were people used to be in fear of him. <clears throat> One of the things at school was the organ in the um, in the chapel. Uh, was had to be pumped, otherwise it wouldn't play, and that was a, a punishment that people had. Half hour organ pumping, and you you got up in the organ loft, pumping the thing, 
and there was a, a weight on on the um, on the wall which showed you the, how much air the thing got in, and if the weight went went below a certain level, it went and <laughs> fizzled out. So one got into a bit of trouble too if you <laughs> the organist organist was busy playing and then suddenly it fizzled out. <laughs> yeah, there are all sorts of uh, things at boarding schools. Of course, nowadays, when, when you think that you can't even touch a child, the things that were done to us were, don't bear thinking about. But we managed to survive. Mm -hmm. Religion seems to me to be uh, the cause of most of the trouble in the, in the world today different uh, faiths that people have and uh, beliefs and uh, religion um, really has a lot to answer for, hasn't it? There's all the troubles that go on and uh, things that are done in the name of religion, gracious me, doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah, I enjoyed school and um, I had quite nice uh, particularly these friends were from Swansea, 1940. I joined um, University College London, where we were evacuated up to Bangor, where, as I say, in the first year we um, must have been... Uh, when the war? The war started in 1939. Um, which I remember very well, because I was on holiday in 1939 with a school friend from um, Ellesmere. A lot of Welsh boys at um, Ellesmere, and uh, got, uh, got very friendly with uh, uh, Tony and Eric Evans at, at Ellesmere. I was on holiday there. And I remember very well on... Um, um, that's, I think it was Sunday, wasn't it? Listening to Chamberlain saying we, we were at war. So that was just before I left um, Ellesmere. Because <clears throat> I was at Ellesmere for the very first beginning of the war. And then joining that, they, they, they got accepted at University College. And we were evacuated, as I said, to Bangor. Uh, amateur dramatics, uh, I suppose, was when I went to um, medical school. It must have been back uh, when I got back to London from being evacuated as a student, and we got back, and I got to Westminster Hospital in London which must have been about 1942, I suppose. I qualified in 1946, so I was a student from 1940 to 46. You, you did your first uh, couple of years, your first MB and your second MB, the first two exams, medical exams, either at University College or King's College, and then you went for your clinical work to Westminster Hospital, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. My second year of medicine, we were evacuated, of all places, to Birmingham. So I didn't spend any time during the first two years of medicine didn't spend much time in London. We were evacuated. Well, then we came back from Birmingham, and I think we were the first ones back to London. And uh, the, the second examination, we worked in London. I was, back, I was at King's College then in the Strand, where we... Um, did our anatomy and physiology and that sort of thing, and that was your pre-clinical pre work. 
in those days, you had to get on with it, um, and you weren't allowed. To, you couldn't fail your exam if you did. You were out. Um, you, after qualifying, you could have a hospital job. In fact, you had to have a hospital job. That was a junior job, which lasted six months. And I had that. Um, that my first job was casualty officer at Charing Cross Hospital. And then uh, that was a junior appointment. Then you either went into the forces or you had a more senior, got a more senior job, which was called a B post, which again lasted six months. Well, I got a more senior post, which was done in uh, Weymouth Hospital. And that lasted six months, and then you could um, get a more senior post again for a further for another six months, and that was back at Westminster Hospital, where I I became um, RMO, and then you had to go in services. Casualty officer, I, well that was my first job after I qualified, and that was at the old Charing Cross Hospital. If I had problems, I uh, as I did, I would ask someone a more senior, well, there was a senior casualty officer. 1946 was a time when um, uh, things were quite rough in London, and uh, there were beat-ups just uh, and robberies. Just Sam and he, we were there at Charing Cross in the middle of it, and um, drug addicts, um, drunks, um, all, all actors, <laughs> and I think we saw everything there. Why uh, uh, that is a junior post, I don't, I really don't know, because it shouldn't be. It should go to a, a more experienced person. But there again, you were on on call pretty well all the time. You uh, slept in the house. That was what one accepted, and that was part of the job in those days, to be on call and to go out and to treat, treat your patients. Well, then I took up golf rather late at life. And uh, that was uh, a great thing, golf. It was my son interested me in golf because he he uh, played and was quite good, and suggested I should. And also, uh, my wife and we were both f age fifty when we started, so I never became any good at golf. But uh, Christine, my wife, she was good. And uh, although a lot of husbands can't play with their, their wives, if their wives beat them, we managed to play together and quite happily. So I didn't mind being beaten anyway because she was so much better than me anyway. So I was quite happy about that. After doing those hospital jobs, I was uh, fully qualified and uh, quite well uh, in seniority in um, hospital jobs and joined the Navy uh, because we had to go in for um, a national service into the RMVR as a certain lieutenant. We were asked, uh, do, you, do you want, uh, are you keen to go to sea or not? Because there's so many branches in the Navy. Five of us said, well, well we, we didn't mind. And the only one who was sent to sea was the one who was married. <laughs> so, so I never got to sea. I got in, into, well, I say never went to sea. I did cross a Portsmouth ferry from uh, Portsmouth to Gosport. Uh, but I got um, put in, into a naval air station. So I joined, I was in the air branch of the Navy 
Naval Air Station was up in Scotland um, in our birth. That's on the um, east coast. I mean, a lovely place. It's not Naval Air Station anymore. It was taken over by, it was called HMS Condor. Everything in the Navy is a ship. And uh, Naval Air Stations are ships. Uh, it was HMS Condor. And um, I was there for a couple of years. Um, didn't do much medicine. It was, uh, but I, uh, they had an amateur dramatic uh, company in which, which I joined and took part in two or three shows. Well, the health service started before I came out of the Navy. I think I came out in 1949. I got married before I came out. I got married while I was still in the Navy. I met my wife at a New Year's Eve dance at Westminster Hospital. She was the sister of a colleague of mine, a medical student, and and she persuaded, she had persuaded him to take her to this <laughs> dance. Anyway, I, I, that's where I met her, and uh, we got married uh, in 1949 while I was in the navy. My wife was Scottish. And her parents, of course, were Scottish. So her parents came from the Irish sky. Her mother did. Her father came from Glasgow. Her father was an air vice marshal in the Air Force. And when we got married, um, they were living in London. He'd retired uh, just about, actually, when we got married. He had just newly retired and they lived in a flat in London. So I was, um, we liked it up in Scotland. We lived in, um, um, we lived in Canoosty for a little while, uh, while I was still in the Navy. And it was lovely actually up there. And we did think about staying up there, but, um, her people were in London, so we thought, well, we wouldn't. 1948, the health service started, I think, but I was still in the, still in the Navy at that time. Well, coming out uh, was a question of trying to get into general practice. This is a sick bay crew. The air station in our berth, which is on the east, um, coast of Scotland. This was um, 1948. Well, my uh, colleague and contemporary, uh, who was surgeon, uh, sur we were surgeon lieutenants together, uh, Hugh Revel and I, who, who joined at the same time, we were much the same age, and uh, we left the Navy much about the same time. And um, funnily enough, he came down to Kent and I ended up in Kent. He came down to Snodland and um, so, uh, where he remained in practice up until he retired. So this medical school thing, RN medical school, but that uh, that was before I got up to Arbor. It was in, in Portsmouth in the barracks there when I first joined and didn't know what branch to, uh, to go in or what the interests were. And uh, we had to do various maneuvers and things for the initial training as it <laughs> much to the delight of um, onlookers because the doctors were pretty stupid at, um, at um, drill and all that sort of thing. Well this picture is of 
my wedding, 1949. My brother, best man, having uh, stopped off at Moss Bros on the way to the church <laughs> to get fitted out. Unfortunate incident, we got involved in a, in a road trip. Somebody smacked into us at Swiss Cottage in London on our way to Moss Pross. It was quite early uh, in the morning, actually. And uh, there was all that kerfuffle and uh, had to get sorted out. And uh, <laughs> my brother was... It was Grand National Day. Not only Grand National Day, but it was Boat Race Day. Everything was happening that day. And we were discussing the Grand National on the, on the, um, on the way when somebody smacked into us. And uh, my brother said, well, what do you think about um, Russian hero for, for the Grand National? And uh, I said, well, it's a complete outsider. Nobody's ever heard of Russian hero. So I don't think too much about it. Uh, well, the um, final insult was a Russian hero won the Grand National. We didn't have anything on run. Won the Grand National at 66 to 1, <laughs> which I always remember. And we got to Mosbros, and we got to uh, the wedding, which was in uh, in a church of Scotland in um, Convent Garden, which is a uh, tiny, tiny church. So my father-in-law, my father, uh, was an air vice marshal in, in the air force, and uh, his pal in the Air Force of Padre yeah, did, the, did the honours at the wedding and uh, so it was a bit of a, uh, a name, uh, not a naval, um, well I was in the Navy, uh, uh, Air Force do. It's the Air Force uh, uh, church really, it's, it's next to the fort Next to the Fortune the Theatre in Covent Garden. And so the church was, was full of um, all my r relatives of Jewish people, all, and um, Christine's relatives were all Scottish, Church of Scotland uh, people, and so uh, there was a great uh, mix up of of people all seem to get on right. Well, coming out uh, was a question of trying to get into general practice, which is what I wanted to do. And it was very, very difficult to get into general practice in those days. It was difficult because it wasn't a question of buying a practice, which one was what one used to do before my time. Um, so that didn't apply. It was a question of applying for a practice and, and going and uh, being uh, amongst a whole lot of applicants um, and whether, whether you got shortlisted or not um, well, it was, it was luck, I suppose. Um, so I, I did um, several locums for general practitioners all over the place for a couple of, well, it was a couple of years, I suppose. I remember at Bridgewater, where we went down and we had an interview with the, with the um, chap who was in practice, whose practice I was trying to join. And we thought we'd uh, pretty well got the job, but uh, in actual fact, we hadn't. My brother, who was already qualified, and he was in the army still, and he was a, and uh, he was a, a visiting. He'd been at Westminster, qualified at Westminster, 
uh, same as me, and he'd been up there and, and I think looked in at lunchtime to go have a drink there or something, and he was talking to the gynaecologist consultant at, at Westminster, and he happened to say his brother was looking for a partner. Well, he, he was Frank Denny, the consultant gynaecologist who I knew very well had delivered uh, my children at Westminster Hospital. I knew very well, of course, and his brother was Don Hasler down here. And my brother said to him, oh, well, my brother's looking for a job. And uh, uh, that was how I got into Mepham practice. I'd never heard of Mepham. No idea. Well, I didn't even know where it was. We were living then in London <coughs> with my uh, parents in a flat with um, my mother and um, uncle and aunt who had, were responsible for bringing us up, as it were. And it was quite a large flat in London. And we lived there uh, and um, went up and down there every day, actually. But stayed with in Don Hasler's house while they were on holiday, and we stayed in... Uh, there were four of us in the practice, Don Hasler and me, this side, and the other side of the practice, which was Longfield and Hartley, was Peter Reed and Jim Jenman. And stayed with Peter Reed in, uh, for quite a while, we were a long time finding a house. Eventually we found a house which we liked, but we couldn't afford it. In those days, this was 1950 I'm talking about, 51. You could get a mortgage for three times your annual salary. Annual salary in those days was, was well, mine was a thousand pounds. So I was limited to three thousand pounds. Uh, to get a mortgage, really couldn't get a house for that. Uh, we looked at a house in Mepham, and it was um, over, just over that, and we we made an offer for that, which was refused. And after a few months, um, the agent came back to us and said, "Well, the price has come down," and uh, I think. It was three thousand four hundred pounds, which we managed to get a mortgage on, and that's how where we moved into Mepham, just above, just above Mepham Green. It's called Broadview. The house was knocked down when we uh, eventually, and uh, three houses built there. So we stayed there from 1951 when we moved in, it must have been late 51. General practice in the um, 1950s until when I retired, which was in the 80s, was very, very different from general practice. Well, everything. The whole medical um, system was different then. There were four of us in a practice, and we, uh, two of us, uh, dealt with the Mepham side, and uh, roughly speaking, and um, two with the heart, the Longfield side. We had surgeries. Uh, in Mepham, Cobham, um, what was the old um, Vigo uh, camp. We had all eight surgeries. The main surgeries were the one in Hartley, um, and the one in Mepham, which, which were done uh, every day and um, twice twice a day, of course. We looked out for one another when we were off um, 
and we were, we were, were on call most of the time, and, and this we uh, arranged with one or other to look out for, for us. So we were on call and we did night calls. We were, um, uh, did a lot of midwifery and a lot of it was at, at home. It got very tiring if you were out um, several times during the night, as, as, um, as very often we were. We used to go to um, um, all or attempt to go to all our um, confinements in, uh, together with the district nurse uh, and or midwife. A lot of our um, midwifery we did at the Livingstone Hospital in Dartford, which was a little cottage hospital, and we were all on the staff of that. Also, a home, a nursing home in um, Horton Kirby. People could elect to have have their baby at home or have it at, uh, in one of these cottage hospitals. Homefield was where we had our main surgery in Mepham. Uh, and that's now been knocked down, but that consisted at first of just two two rooms. There was no chemist in Mepham in those days, and we did our own dispensing. We had a, a, a lady, who, uh, Miss Hopkins, who, who owned the house, actually, and she did um, the dispensing, but we also did our own dispensing, mixing up mixtures and bottles and uh, counting out tablets and God knows what. Uh, which, of course, nowadays they're all pre-packed and pre-bottled and uh, it's just a question of taking it off the shelf. Didn't have to mix up any prescriptions or anything nowadays. In those days we did. We had prescriptions which were, we would write out prescriptions with several ingredients on it and uh, have them mixed up or do it yourself, mix them up yourself. You spend a lot of time mixing up great Winchesters of uh, <clears throat> mixtures. We didn't have the staff like, like they have now. <clears throat> and of course, computers didn't exist. We used to do um, child welfare clinics also. Uh, I used to do a clinic at Mepham Village Hall with the health visitor. If one got into difficulties, and one did, uh, I mean, with with um, with midwifery, you never know what's going to happen, and anything can happen uh, uh, at any time, un unforeseen, and things did. And there was um, a system where if you got stuck or uh, in trouble, um, for instance, out in the caravan site in Vigo Village, the hospitals had a, a flying squad system uh, that came from West Hill Hospital in Dartford, where a fully equipped ambulance with a, um, a doctor and a midwife um, would man it and uh, if, um, if you got in trouble they would come out but of course it, it took a while for them to get from West Hill Hospital to the caravan site in which case <laughs> well in, in which case you had to just uh, manage. Well there were all sorts of, of uh, emergencies, things like one of the things that that um, happens is you get a retained placenta, or um, the baby beams the wrong way round, and and you couldn't get it, you couldn't get it turned. In fact, my first 
memory of a confinement in a Nissen hut in Vigo. Well, one of my partners said to me, all right, <clears throat> I'm going to need a bit of help. You can't deliver the baby normally. Um, you have to give it uh, some help by applying forceps and pulling on it, and that involves an anaesthetic. The other end. So I'm, I'm going to need a bit of help. Which end do you want to take? <laughs> right, I put on the, I think I elect, elected to put on the faucet, and I never put on faucet before. A hospital, you'd seen it done, <clears throat> and you knew how it was done. Well, we got the, the, the faucet, and I knew which one should be put on first, as it was important which one you put on first, and which one second. And we did manage. When I say an anaesthetic, you had to use open ether. By open, I mean put a mask on. It, I mean, in someone's house, I mean, putting a mask on someone's face and dripping the thing over as the ether or chloroform. We didn't use chloroform. We stopped using chloroform. Uh, <clears throat> but an open ether we used. And um, or ethyl chloride sometimes, um, but that's how it was administered. And the forceps were boiled up in a saucepan. This is in someone's mission hut. Um, <laughs> and what what scrubbing up you could do, you did, and that was how it went on. And we did uh, uh, get very tired being. Um, eternally on call. I got fed up and uh, um, my uh, wife's brother, who um, was a student together with me, he was a very clever chap and he, he became a consultant and he moved to Canada. And at that time, a lot of them did. And I personally was thinking too of going, but it seemed an awful upheaval. We'd got the, the children now. But I, ever since I was a student, I had, I've suffered from back trouble. It used to be called a slip disc. I don't know what it's called now, but funnily enough, I had a patient who had the same, was troubled with um, this low back pain, same thing. Diagnosed as slip disc, and she had uh, all, well, she had everything done. Um, traction was the favorite method of treatment in those days. Uh, traction was going to a physiotherapy department, being stretched, and um, Sometimes being put in plaster casts, sometimes in um, corsets, all sorts of things. She'd had a lot. Acupuncture and and everything um, and nothing. Nothing did the trick uh, at all. Still bothered with it. And she went away on holiday. It was in the summer. And she went to Austria. And she happened to slip and fall, uh, not a long distance, but on a, on a hill or a mountain, slip and jerk herself. And from that moment, she had no trouble. <laughs> had no trouble, everything cleared up, finished, <laughs> cured. <laughs> so I have recommended people go. <laughs> Go to Switzerland and fall down. Well, I did, but not in the summer. We used to go skiing. That's funny now. That, that was all right. It never used to bother me. And I was an idiot at skiing. And it would fall over. Mind you, if you're, if you're a, um, an idiot at it, you fall very carefully. More, more carefully than if you're an expert, I think.
<laughs> when I retired, when Christine died, and she was very ill, and uh, um, uh, so I retired really early to look after her. I retired in 1987. That's most of the time looking after Christine, who eventually died after we built a little villa in Spain. We built a little villa in Spain, which had really kept, kept her going throughout her awful illness, um, which lasted five years. Oh, well, <laughs> The theatre, oh, the, well, that, that went back, oh, gosh, yes. Well, funnily enough, when we moved to Aberdare Gardens, we were six children, as, as I said, like my brother and my sister and the three cousins and, and me. And our next-door neighbours were six children. Uh, well, they went, uh, yes, they were uh, same sort of age as us. And funnily enough, our names tied up. For instance, um, I was Dickie, and one of them was Mickey. One of the girls was Mickey. One of the girls was Audrey, and my brother was Aubrey. And <laughs> that was really rather strange sort of coincidence. Anyway, Audrey was the youngest. And I got and we got very friendly together and we were always together. We were the same age. They were a, a theatrical family. The, her father, Audrey's father, uh, in I don't know whether he invented it but he was very much concerned with what was called at that time the bioscope, which was the very early cinema. They used to put on little um, comical sketches, particularly at Christmas time. And one of the earliest ones <laughs> I remember was a sketch about Hamlet, how old must I have been about um, seven or eight, I suppose. I remember the lines, the lines. I, they were looking for Hamlet, and I said, uh, I think you'll find him lurking in the ramparts. He seemed to take a fancy for the damp parts. Ha, 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 exit left. <laughs> so... That, that was a very early um, recollection of uh, my involvement in the theatre. My father um, took me... <clears throat> he took me to the first show I ever saw, and I remember that very well. It was a Coliseum, <clears throat> and it was a musical. And I was so impressed with this. So how old was I? He left when I was eight. So I was six or seven, I suppose. I'm so impressed with this because it was such a magnificent place with a um, Coliseum in London, that is, with a um, revolving stage and everything. But that was my first recollection of the theatre, and, I, and uh, I was very keen also on the cinema. And my father used to tell me. And in those days, you go to the cinema, you, uh, it cost you sixpence, old sixpence. There were two films, a stage show, maybe an organ came up, and um, news, a news reel, and you were in the whole afternoon there. Uh, and uh, you could sit down and go around again if you wanted to. Anyway, he used to play with his gypsy orchestra in the interval. And so I got to go to the cinema quite a bit. 
with him, and to see he played the music halls too. I remember him playing at the Home and Empire before it um, closed. So that must have been, well, the early 1930, I suppose. And I had a little, um, a little um, pathoscope home cine, and with Audrey, we produced, someone gave us a screen. But we put on uh, <coughs> cinema shows for the family. And they came to see it, we printed tickets and uh, that sort of thing. My first year back in London at Westminster, which was, must have been about 1942 or three, 42 or three. And I was, I was in the chorus of that, and every year they um, wrote one and wrote the music, and um, that got me involved. At that time, there were no female students. So they put on their own pantomime, wrote their own pantomime, a couple of chaps. Uh, and that's where I got involved in the pantomime. In 1946, when I was a resident medical officer, and it was my th thing, the Red RMO presents uh, the, the Christmas pantomime, and I had part of Cinderella in that part. And I, <laughs> of course, I remember that very well. I had uh, this off-the-shoulder dress which much of everybody knew and fell off on. <laughs> In fact, I had a recording of that, um, which was done at the Abbey Road um, studios where the, uh, the Beatles were. Met and Players started in 1945. Uh, and uh, yes, it was, it was going in 19... Um, 50, 51, when I, I think my first play I was in was called um, Miss Mabel, yeah, R.C. Sheriff, written by R.C. Sheriff. Um, and I, I joined, and, and um, young men were at a premium then, as they are now, in, uh, <laughs> in Mepham Players. <clears throat> so I got interested and joined and uh, and got to be in a lot of shows. Being chairman uh, um, <laughs> was between usually one year it was it was Ken Newton, one year it was Stan Murren, next year it was me, and so we we went round like that. So uh, yes. Stan Murray, he was a great, great lad, uh, man for producing, and he was quite, a, he was a good actor too. Uh, there were all sorts of people came and went, and uh, I remember them um, really quite well. So the, the question of pantomimes in, um, <clears throat> in Mepham arose because the there weren't many pantomimes in London uh, then, just after the war. Before the war, the, the pantomime, I remember the pantomimes very well because we used to, I used to be taken to the Lyceum a pantomime, which, which was lovely. There was a fellow called Jack Lee, I can't remember, it was Jack, Jack Lee or Nat Jack Lee, he was in it, or his father, and he wore the same tights every <laughs> every year, and, uh, and uh, I thought that that was lovely. But after the war, um, there weren't any decent pantomimes. There was a pantomime in in um, Chatham, a 
uh, I can't remember the name of the theatre, doesn't exist anymore. And it, it was really horrid, and, and it wasn't for children, and it was filthy dirty, and really wasn't like the pantomimes that I knew. And um, I took, there was one pantomime in London at the Coliseum, and I remember, um, I remember the people who were in it, but I can't think of their name. But it wasn't very good. It was very pretty, and it was very well staged, and it was lovely, and uh, but wasn't really very funny. And it, I remember taking Michael. He was um, the, one of the first uh, um, things that he went to, uh, and it just wasn't any. He was bored stiff with it. And I thought, well, the only thing to do is to write like we had done at Westminster Hospital. So I did. Um, did and that's what started me writing the pantomimes, really, because it incorporated all the children. And it was for children, and there was nothing nasty in it. And um, that was my idea of a pantomime. Yeah. The first pantomime was Jack and the Beanstalk. Yes. The first one we, I wrote, yes, was Jack and the Beanstalk. And then we wrote the music and um, and everything. And the children's um, scene was always... The, the pantomime was designed so that the children's scene would be the first one after the interval. So, and the children were rehearsed separately. The children's scene was pretty well the children's scene. And it was usually uh, the, um, something that what we thought was spectacular, done in ultraviolet light or something like that. And uh, that was the beginning of the ultraviolet light thing that, that, um, that we had. Um, anyway, so, so we wrote it and then as the years went on we decided uh, that it, we'd write one <coughs> because it took a long time to write and, and um, get the music and, and we, we made sure that we didn't use any music that wasn't our own. And I was very, very um, um, very adamant about that, and we never did. We never used pop songs or, or, or anything like that. The war game in 1965, a fellow called Peter Watkins, <clears throat> um, who was uh, on the BBC, he was from the BBC. Well, he was an extraordinary chap, Peter Watkins, because he um, he came from uh, locally to Kent. He was going to do this. He wanted to make this film, The War Game, which was based on a, a nuclear explosion and what, what would likely or possibly happen in, in Kent. And he came and he asked, he wanted just to use amateurs, which he did. And he would, uh, he asked for any companies, amateur companies who were interested to come along and we all met and um, and uh, anyone who was interested didn't matter. He, he said, "Doesn't matter whether you've got any previous experience or, or not. Anyone who wants to be in it to come along." And of course, a lot of people did. He'd written this script, and the way he cast it was to look at look at you and says, "Right, I, uh, I want you to be." Um, um, so and so, and uh, he, whether you could speak 
or not, he, he got out of you exactly what he wanted, and, he, and that was what was so clever about him. All the stuff that I was involved in, it was in Grace End. I had all sorts of parts, half of which weren't, half of which were cut out. There were riots in the, the, during this um, um, scene and um, a food shortage and people going mad to get it. And somebody came into my shop, wanted a loaf of bread and I hadn't got any bread so he, he, uh, he um, beat me up. And I was bleeding all, all over, bleeding all over the white coat and I had to say something. I can't remember it is. It's a man came into my shop and uh, uh, I can't remember the exact lines. Anyway, I was explaining what what happened, but they never used the scene. And that was the only speaking part that I I had. It was all, uh, uh, <laughs> it was all action. <laughs> uh, I had to drive a two-ton lorry and stop. The fellow was lying in the road. And I had to stop just before running him over. There. And then I got hauled out of it uh, by the lot of thugs and uh, beaten up. And, oh, well, that's why I'm trying to get away. <laughs> I get hauled out of it and I try to get away from them, but they uh, catch up with it. Anyway, this went on for a long time and it, and it took a, an awful long time doing it. Um, making this film, and eventually he did. He got it done. And uh, the BBC wouldn't put it on. It was too horrifying. And the makeup artists were fantastic. They spent a whole day making up somebody with awful wounds, with Rice Krispies and God knows, God knows what. Man. And then that bit wouldn't be used. And this was a, it was a revelation, really. But it didn't cost much because it was all uh, amateurs. Oh, there were all, all dreadful scenes of executions and, and, and graves. <laughs> I don't know what the residents thought about it, but I know uh, that they were um, very confused because there were people going round as policemen who weren't pleased with, who were uh, uh, in the in the film, and um, <laughs> and that sort of thing. I remember that that song, which I had on uh, on a record. Um, Cinderella song. <laughs> I'm a baron's daughter, and Cinderella is my name. I've got all that really matters, though there'll be a scene or two before I'm really seen by you. I'm really on the road to fame. <laughs>